And our next speaker is Stephen Pasiki from Lehigh University. Thank you. Uh, the work I'm going to present to you is actually work that was performed by Dan Cook, who's one of my master's students who uh, finished in 2008. Um, and work was sponsored by uh, a program we have in the state of Pennsylvania called PETA, the Pennsylvania Infrastructure Technology Alliance, which supports research at Lehigh University and Carnegie Mellon University uh, together, and also through the Center for Advanced Technology Large Structural Systems, or the Atlas Center at Lehigh University. Uh, let me begin by saying I'm a structural engineer. This is my usual environment in the university, working in a structural engineering research laboratory. I'm not a fire protection engineer. Forgive me in advance for any uh, egregious errors I may make in some of my modeling. Be kind in your comments. Offer them as suggestful, uh, su uh, helpful criticisms rather than um, a beating. We've been involved in, in fire-related research at Lehigh University for the last 10 years. I, like many other structural engineering professors, first became interested in this topic uh, after the events of 9-11. You know, so roughly, you know, that's, about, that's how long I've been working in this area. And principally, our interest is the second objective here, which is to evaluate the impact of fire loads on structural response. That's what we spend most of our time doing. But I also am interested in some of the other aspects of this, such as the fire modeling, and actually determining what the loads are on structures. I would like to be able, in practice as a structural engineer, to be able to treat fire much the same way we treat earthquake. And we don't do that. I mean, you all know that in designing buildings, you know, in routine sorts of work that we do in building design, um, you know, it's left to folks other than a structural engineer to worry about the structure, unless you get into some special work that some of the consultants are doing. But typically, the structural engineer has no role in designing a structure for fire. I'd like to see that change sometime during the course of my career, where we think about fire as a load, just like we treat the self way of the structure, live load, wind loads, earthquake, uh, blast effects, other things that act on structures. So we need to take some look at that. So as a structural engineer, I'm trying to bring my perspective to looking at fire loads uh, acting on structures. Uh, we became interested in first using FDS as a tool to, to start to uh, do some work in this area. And we wanted to keep the problem simple for us, so we looked at parking garages, simply because they're non-combustible structures, typically a precast concrete or a cast-in-place concrete parking garage. If you look at it, there's very little combustible material actually in the construction. They uh, have well-controlled ventilation conditions. They typically don't have windows, except maybe in the, in the stair towers in the corners or something like that. So we don't have to worry about modeling things like glass breakage or things like that. The ventilation conditions, with the exception of ambient wind, are fairly well controlled. And the combustibles are also fairly well defined. There's only so many places you can put vehicles in the parking stalls, in the driving lanes. Um, so we thought that the positions and, and the fuel loads were fairly well uh, defined. So we thought it was good type of structure for us to, to work on in our work. So that's what we set about doing. We've looked at both concrete and steel parking garages, and this particular presentation focuses on steel parking decks. What we did was we set about designing a series of these steel parking decks using a reference that's published by AISC, um, Design, Guide 18, Design Guide 18, which really is their best effort. AISC, who's, in interest of promoting, who's interested in promoting steel construction, is their best effort in what steel parking decks should look like, the most efficient layouts, the most efficient spans use of, of materials to, to make those structures economically competitive with other materials. So we designed a series of those, series of those structures and we developed some models using PyroSim and then ran the, the fire analyses. We looked at the results in terms of you know, the temperature distributions throughout the structure, but then we also took those results, and we, particularly the heat flux uh, data, and we used it as input then to follow on um, heat transfer analysis and in some cases a structural analysis as well. We wanted to understand then the other objective, which is what is the impact on the structure. This is the document I'm talking about. It's a very good document in terms of uh, you know, taking the best thinking of the industry in terms of how to design um, parking decks, open de parking decks out of uh, steel. And that's what we use to guide our, our work. We actually looked at five different configurations, uh, terminology here. Um, we looked at cast in place, post tension systems, and also reinforced concrete slabs on metal decks. Uh, we lo looked at both long span and short span configurations. So it's difficult to see in these drawings, and I apologize, but you get a sense that this is one of the long span options where you're going halfway across the width of the parking deck. In this plan view, typically what you would have is this might be a ramp, then a turnaround, then a ramp up to the next level, and this sort of winds its way up the structure and back down again. So this would be a long span system. 
This drawing actually shows two systems. There's a long span on this side and a short span. So you can see a member here, which is a relatively short span, then a longer span. So the col there are column locations, which will become clear, which are inserted in the, in the um, parking areas. Um, so there's a total of five different systems that we looked at, uh, both uh, cast in place and post tension uh, concrete. We took, from all of these, we basically took a representative you know, sort of slice with across the structure uh, to study. And so it would look something like this in plan view. The yellow, these are the vehicles that are parked in, in the parking stalls. These are the driving lanes. And we used roughly a five inch square uh, cell size cube to, to model this. And that was compatible with most of the member depths and whatnot that we were dealing with. So it allowed us to model the slab thickness and, and the other obstructions in the structure. This is the, uh, the layout of our test matrix. In this particular study, looking at steel parking decks, we, we ran seven different analyses, and we looked at the variables of the different framing geometries, the floor elevation, and by that I mean whether the floors are offset as they would be in the driving ramps, or whether the floors are parallel as they might be in a longer deck once you've climbed the ramp, or certainly in the turnaround regions as you go around the corner. And we also looked at the vehicle, um, the fire characteristics as well. So looking first at the framing, um, oh, what did I do? Sorry about that. Looking first at the, uh, the framing geometry, we looked at the notation here is PT means a post-tension, LS means a long-span system. So there's both long and short-span post-tension systems. There are two different reinforced concrete layouts, one and two. One of these has both a long and a short-span system. And then this idea of level, that just gets that deals with whether or not the parking, the, the opposite size of structure at the same elevation or not. So we looked at five different uh, framing geometries. This is what they look at, look like very quickly, uh, and both in plan view and in an elevation view. And, and most of them have the, the, the two elevations, they're offset because we're looking at a region in the center of the structure where you'd have the driving lane. So you know this might be sloping up and the other side sloping down or, or, or uh, the other direction. So those are the, the post-tension long-span systems. This is a short-span system because there are, are columns in there that reduce the spans of the girders and also the depth of the girders, which would inflate, influence the, uh, the heat flow laterally across the structure. These are reinforced concrete systems. And again, now you can start to see some of the columns that would be inserted. If you've ever parked in a garage with columns in the parking stalls, you know how difficult that can be. So that's not as uh, typical as you would see in a, as a long-span system. And then finally, the uh, the last system that we looked at. We looked at the two floor elevations, and as I mentioned, what that simply refers to is you know, the, the typical situation in the driving lanes where there is some offset, and then in, in a longer structure, once you would clear that ramp, and the, the two elevations be the same elevation, the two sides of the structure at the same elevation, or certainly in the turnaround regions at the end of the garage. So we looked at that as well. And also you can see that the domain that we treat it extends beyond the structure, so there is the ability for any heat that escapes under the spandrel to be able to re-enter the structure in the floor above. And we looked at vehicle fire characteristics as well. Uh, we actually looked at the literature. Um, there was a series of fire tests that were done in Japan. I have a colleague there, uh, Dr. Kono, who made available to me a whole series of um, vehicle fires that they had tested, uh, vehicles that they had burned and done uh, captured the information from. So we have the, the vehicle that we selected was actually um, a Toyota 4Runner. It had a, a, a peak heat flux of about uh, 5,000 kilowatts and about uh, 7,000 megajoules total energy. After Mark's talk yesterday, I have no, I'm not as much confidence in this as not knowing the ignition source, not knowing the, the effective radiated feedback and changing that, uh, not knowing where the fire was started in the vehicle. Thanks, Mark, for giving me all that confidence in the, uh, what I did. Um, but this, we actually took an actual record and simply installed, used that as uh, we had a burner that we simply used that um, heat release rate coming from that burner to, to simulate the, the vehicle fire. And then we also looked at a situation where we had multiple vehicles burning. So we had um, the fire start in one vehicle and then jump to two others and then jump to two others. And the other work that we had done looking at um, precast parking structures, we actually looked at fire jumping between floors as well. So you had the, the fire sort of working its way up the structure. So a very simplistic approach. It's sort of you know, trying to capture the effect of multiple vehicle fires. And then this is sort of how we broke it down into the six uh, different domains to run it on um, 
uh, different processors together. In total, there's like 3.3 million elements uh, in the model. I forget how long they took to run. It was a matter of like eight or nine days, I think, for each uh, analysis. Uh, looking again at the output, what we were principally interested in for the next step was the heat flux information that we could take into our abacus finite element models. But we also were interested in thermal slices to get ideas, again, of sort of the overall horizontal slices and vertical slices through the structure, what the temperature looked like throughout. And then the pinpoint locations and thermocouples trying to capture specific information, in particular the temperatures we were looking at. So these are some cross sections. These are taken at the, the ceiling height, or a little, just below the ceiling, so these are horizontal slices through the structures, the different systems, the post-tension long span, the post-tension short span, and really they're this, more or less the, the same. The only difference is the insertion of some columns and a little shallow girder depth. And you get a sense of, you can see how the fire, the heat is being tra trapped or compartmentalized between the depths of the girders. If you go into the reinforced concrete systems, again, you can see what happens. And you can very clearly actually see, probably more clearly here than the other sketches, the framing plans and sort of how the heat's being trapped uh, between the, uh, the different members. Um, we, and we noted similar trends in the, uh, the heat flux time histories. And then just we did capture those heat flux time histories uh, and then spread them out in, in the abacus heat transfer models um, as heat flux along the surfaces. This is an example of what happened um, in that analysis where we had the, uh, either the, the structures were, they were the, the two opposite sides of the structure were at the same elevation, or the more typical case was when they were offset and you had to heat flowing from one side to the other. Um, and what we found was actually that this was not as severe a case for the temperature and the heat flux in this location because the heat had other places to go, okay? Um, and then where it was more concentrated in this situation here. Um, and again, you can sort of see that here. Oh, this is, this is the example where we had just one vehicle fire versus we had multiple vehicle fires. So we're spreading from at six minute intervals, we're engaging two additional vehicles on either side of the initial start vehicle. And then, of course, this led to, to larger temperatures. We took the results of the FDS analyses and we, we pulled it into uh, uh, Abacus uh, to do a heat transfer analysis. We haven't pushed these results very far. It, and I, as far as we did in the other uh, study, we really only looked at cross-section temperatures and tried to get an idea of the reduction that we would get in steel strength. Uh, but we haven't really yet pushed it to really analyze sort of the 3D geometry of the structure. Um, but anyway, we used Abacus to try and um, determine what reductions we would get in, in stiffness and in um, yield strength using the equations given in the Eurocode. So based on some other work that we had done, we, we used actually linear elements. Uh, we used three elements through the flange thicknesses, two elements through the web. Um, more recent work, we're starting to use more higher order elements. Um, we got around some of the numerical ringing problems that we were having uh, previously. Um, and this is a typical result that you might see, the temperature distribution, the bottom flange, of course, getting very hot. The top flange being a little more protected because you have the heat sink of the slab you also really are only getting heat from one side, from below, where the bottom flange are you know, it's exposed all around. So the bottom flange is, of course, getting much hotter, but that's really your tension element in the system in terms of the span of that structure. So uh, it's an important element. These are the, uh, the Eurico relationships, and really the ones that are of interest are the reduce. This just shows the reduction in the elastic modulus, normalized as a function of temperature and the reduction in the yield strength. You know, we see it starting to drop off you know, around 400 degrees C or so. So we took the results of the fine element analyses and curves like this to understand what sorts of reductions we might get in yield strength. And again, looking at things like the single vehicle fire or the same structural system, the post-tension long span system, but where we have multiple vehicles, uh, you see we're getting a lot hotter um, in the case where we have the multiple vehicle fire. But we, here we have some numbers now that we can actually look and try and understand the impact of uh, on, a, on the response. This sort of summarizes it, uh, all the results that we had. And what, the way we're summarizing is we're showing the temperature, we're showing the reductions in yield strength. If you focus on just yield strength and elastic modulus, forget this is just proportional limit, that's not that important. Yield strength and elastic modulus 
in the top flange web and bottom flange for the different analysis cases. So for the post-tension long span system, uh, the post-tension uh, long span system um, where, where we have we're at the same level um, versus whether at the staggered level or where we have the multiple vehicle fire. And you can see the kinds of reductions we're getting in yield strength in the bottom flange. In some cases, we're not getting any reduction. It's heating up, it's staying, um, temperature is low enough that we're not actually getting reduction in yield strength. Uh, we are getting some reduction in stiffness to dramatic reductions. You know, if you have a multiple vehicle fire, then you're losing most of the capacity that you have in terms of the tension capacity of, of that girder. But again, the effects might be very localized. And as you go further away, you see it drops off very quickly. We didn't look at the three-dimensional response of the structure and what sort of alternative low pass could develop as you start to soften and start to weaken uh, the member that's most closely located to the fire. So the conclusions are kind of obvious. Um, deeper framing members obstruct the flow of gases. Um, and, so we say that we can concentrate the heat between those. Um, if you decrease the girder spacing, you get smaller compartments. We also, the members tend to get shallower, but the smaller compartment actually tends to, to, to cause the temperature to be even hotter. Uh, even though you're getting more sort of gases spilling out from under, just a smaller compartment tends to compartmentalize it right above the vehicle and get the local temperatures even hotter. Um, if you have that offset from one side of the structure to the other, it actually does provide a means for heat to go to escape and reduce the temperature locally. What we didn't look at in this study, and we had in a previous study, was if you trace and look at vehicle fire sort of jumping from floor to floor, and if you've seen these parking garages, that's reasonable because the vehicles are almost parked on top of each other. When you get to that top floor, if the vehicles burn their way up there, then obviously that can get a lot hotter because you've preheated it from all the vehicles burning below before you finally get to that fire right at that location and that part of the structure. We didn't run that case here. Multiple vehicle fires, of course, getting hotter. Um, and then, in, in summary, we were getting these sorts of results that a single vehicle fire, the largest we were getting was a 12% reduction in yield strength, which is certainly tolerable. Uh, but if you're looking at a multiple vehicle fire without any intervention, um, we're getting dramatic reductions up to 88%. There is a report available on this. Uh, there is a, a report that fully documents the study. If you're interested, you can shoot me an email, and I'd be more than happy to send you uh, that. I have electronically. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions for Steve. Jim. I'm curious to see what kind of heat fluxes you're getting to the steel above the fire. I don't recall. I have the report. We can sit down and look at it. I can pull it out of the graph on there, but I could read it from here. Yeah. I I can try and find it. We can see. Yeah, now, wh what is that and where is it? And this would be what these graph is showing. This is for the different systems. I can't read it myself. Uh, for the different structural systems that we looked at and I guess it's getting up to the peak one is about seven, seven kilowatts. Watt. Seven kilowatts per meter square. It doesn't make sense. It's much, much too low. So it's like a decimal place got slipped. That's possible. I have to. I have to go back and look. This. I mean, it, it would be more credible above a fire like that, where you're imposing it on a steel deck above the fire to have heat fluxes up to uh, as much as 100 kilowatts per meter squared. So I, maybe uh, that's downstream of the fire. Uh, but I, I don't know where this take, point take is. Take a look at that. No, I, I don't know where this. I, I confess, I put this together from the student's master's thesis, and I took a lot of them out. I may have kept one that was further away. Let me, I'll look at that. And that was the input to the, to the final element analysis. So this may have been one that was further away. I may have just, I don't know. Assuming it comes the way it's steel, some of the temperatures are showing are just about higher than Yeah, they are. And that's why I'm. I'm wondering, this may have been, 
the opposite side of the surface away from the fire. So it may be the wrong graph. I just cut a bunch of these out. I'm right. sorry. We also have a question from the. I think this is heat flux to the structure. All right, and we have one question from a remote viewer. Uh, from the web, uh, which faces of the car obstruction were defined as the fire surface and why? I'm sorry. Which faces of the car obstruction were defined as the fire surface and why? What, what we did there was we actually put the burner uh, in the uh, compartment of the vehicle. So it's actually this surface right here. And, and then on top of it is this other surface. So the, the, this, is the burn, this is the burner right here. And it's slightly larger than this, the roof of the, structure, uh, the car, which is right here. Okay, thank you. Sure. What, what's interesting about that, yeah. the, the database we had had about 13 or 14 vehicles. And what was interesting is we plotted the total energy release versus model year. You could actually see it climbing with model year as you went to less steel, more. Yeah, and that kind of gets to the point that Mark was saying yesterday that that was one of the problems with this. When we looked at the idea of how quickly to, to do this flame spread, we actually looked at, there was a Scranton fire test that was done in the 70s. They burned, they had three cars, they'd light, they burned the middle one and it didn't spread. Yeah, no, I know. I know, so we, we had to take a leap. So we definitely took a leap. And, and the fire that we took, the vehicle we took was of that portfolio of 14 different um, fire tests. We took the one that had the highest energy content because we saw a very clear trend in model year and that went through the early 90s. I mean, it was a late money, but it, it certainly was already old. So we kind of extrapolate. So let's take the high end, which may be somewhere in the middle today. It's not a Cadillac Escalade. <laughs> right. Thanks, again. Uh, thank you.